Hello, my, my name is Mark Roberts and I'm going to be speaking to you in this session about this key issue within gender and education, uh, the idea about how we can best motivate boys to succeed in our classrooms. And I'm going to look at some of the research around this uh, specific topic of motivation today. But I'm also going to give you some practical advice, some, some quick tips that you can do to start making a difference to the motivation levels of the boys that you teach. Uh, now, I'm the author of a couple of books uh, around uh, tackling the, the gender attainment gap. Uh, the first was a book that was co-authored in 2019 with Matt Pinkett, Boys Don't Try. And a more recent follow-up is 2021's The Boy Question. And both of these take research, but they also think of the classroom teacher uh, and what they can do in practical terms to make sure that, that boys that they teach uh, flourish. So this key, key question of motivation is something that we're going to focus on in this session. And we're going to break it down with some of the research to begin with. And the research pattern around this is quite bleak reading. Uh, when you look at all of the, the journals and the, the studies that have been done into um, boys and girls and academic motivation, it shows very clearly um, that, that girls tend to believe that they're not as able as they are and then they put extra work in to make up for those uh, perceived deficits whereas boys tend towards overconfidence and are more likely to take their foot off the gas when it comes to to studying and, and, and working hard as a result of that and the research also suggests that girls tend to take more pride not just in the the quality of their work but also the, the quantity of their work there's also evidence there to show that girls tend to keep concentrating more when they're studying. They also think about where their learning is going and they're far more likely to step back and, and reflect and to evaluate on how their study sessions have gone and, and where their, their kind of weaknesses are and, and things that they need to improve on moving forward. Also, the evidence uh, around academic motivation tends that girls are, are more likely to keep going and show resilience, particularly when they're attempting complex work, especially things that involve lots of reading and writing. So we can see there that, that, that that's something that's an absolutely central part of, of a successful academic career, lots of reading and writing involved, and it's something that, that girls tend to show a, a greater amount of determination uh, to keep motivated when they hit difficult work uh, and difficult text to, to understand. So if we're going to think about ideas around motivation, it's helpful at this point to break down motivation further, to think about the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. These may be terms that are, you're already familiar with, or they may be new to you, so I'm just going to give you a bit of a recap into what we mean by extrinsic and intrinsic motivation when we're thinking about, about academic motivation. If you go to, to the website, the, the Noun Project, you may be familiar with this. It's a, it's a website where you type a word in and it will throw up icons that are meant to represent uh, those words. So they give you symbols that are there um, to, to help you, um, you know, represent it in some way visually. And if you type in motivation into the, the Noun Project website, the first images that you're confronted with, with, with um, are, are immediately these ones and they give us this sense, this suggestion, that motivation is, is about some form of, of competition. It's about some kind of um, desire to, to be the best at something, to get some kind of rewards, to be up there on a pedestal. And in the case of the one on, on the far side, it, it's a suggestion that, that motivation is going to lead to cash and to financial rewards. And these kinds of uh, images really fit the idea of extrinsic motivation, the sense of um, what do we get out of things as, as, as individuals and, and thinking specifically around things like external rewards. So if we pause for a moment and think about a, a boy who does his homework, he hands his homework in, it might be that he's handing that homework in because you give him a sticker or you give him a house point or, or whatever kind of system of rewards that you use. Or it might be that he hands that homework in to avoid having a detention, to avoid getting a demerit, to avoid having to have a phone call home and getting into trouble and so on. 
Or it might be that this boy he hands his homework in because he, he wants to be recognised as really good in this subject and he's especially keen to try to, to get one over on his peers to be seen as better than them at a particular subject or topic. Now students who are driven by extrinsic motivation tend to set performance goals uh, and these are what researchers look at in terms of trying to, to get, achieve a means to an end, trying to, to reach a particular target. Um, so we might say, for example, uh, a student who, who is driven to do well academically, they might be thinking in terms of performance goals, hitting a certain percentage in their SATs paper, or they might be thinking more in terms of achieving five, grade five to nines at GCSE thinking that this will give them a, a certain chance of getting on a course and that this course will give them the opportunity to go off and, and have a, a, a particular career that might lead them to earn £75,000 a year or something like that as an example. So that would be an example of, of a student who's driven by ex extrinsic motivation. But if we go back to that same Noun Project website and we, we scroll down further and further, we noticed that there were some other symbols that would suggest uh, an alternative way of looking at motivation. And as these symbols suggest, motivation can also be about the sense of feeling fulfilled at having achieved something, getting better at something, knowing more about something over time. Particularly as the one on the right hand side shows, uh, when you've had to really struggle to achieve something, that can give you this real warm, fuzzy glow uh, that, that comes internally. Uh, and if we think about something like a you know, 5,000 piece jigsaw puzzle, we don't do those jigsaw puzzles because somebody gives us something as, as a reward for completing them. We do them because we get this real sense of satisfaction as we put that last piece of blue sky into place and that real uh, kind of pattern on the back that we give ourselves um, and, and the, the kind of joy that can come from, from having achieved something that, that's been difficult along the way. And these ideas really fit into the, the, the pattern of academic intrinsic motivation. The idea that the, that the reward comes from within and that there's something joyful, dare I say, about learning stuff and knowing stuff and getting better at stuff over time. So those, those, that same boy who's doing his, his homework, he's not doing that because he, he's getting a sticker. He's doing it because he, he gets this, this sense of satisfaction at completing something and recognising that he's, he's getting better and that this homework is helping him with that. Now in terms of intrinsic motivation, students who are driven by that, they tend to embrace challenge so that they're more likely to do the more complex tasks. They like feedback that enables them to, to improve, even if that feedback is, is quite critical. Whereas students who are driven by extrinsic motivation would tend to avoid challenge because it might stop them from getting to their targets and they'd much prefer an easier route. Uh, and also they tend to avoid feedback that, that doesn't flatter them. They prefer feedback that flatters them and they don't want this kind of robust feedback that's lay, laying bare their, their weaknesses and, and the things that they need to develop on. Now, students who are driven by intrinsic motivation see failures and mishaps and things that go, go wrong um, as an opportunity to learn from and an opportunity to, to develop more in the long run. Uh, whereas students who are driven by extrinsic motivation tend to see failure as a, as a disaster because, again, it's not allowing them to, to reach this specific target, this specific performance point that they've set themselves. So by contrast, students who are driven by intrinsic motivation tend to set mastery goals. So goals about gradually getting better at something or knowing more about something over time. So if we think of, of another practical example, uh, you've got two students who are both learning the piano. Uh, one of them is desperate to get to grade seven before their friend um, to get this real sense of um, recognition and, and getting one over on their friend. Whereas the, the other student might be more driven by a mastery goal and they're not so bothered about the grades they get to, but there's a particular piece uh, of music by Chopin that they want to be able to, to get better at that and to, to really be able to appreciate 
uh, the skill that's involved in, in doing so. So just a couple of examples of how extrinsic and intrinsic motivation can, can be seen uh, in a different way with different students. Now the research is pretty clear that when it comes to academic motivation, girls are more likely to be intrinsically motivated. So more likely to see learning as something that, that, that brings about rewards uh, within for yourself, uh, that learning is something that's joyful within, its, within yourself and that it's something that's rewarding for its own sake rather than meeting particular targets and getting particular payoffs as a result of it. Now you might think, okay, well, why does that matter? What, what's, what's the problem if you've got some students who are, are driven by the prospect of, of rewards and, and getting something out of it uh, that's very tangible, whereas other students uh, are more driven by, by the idea of just you know, becoming a better biologist over time or, or whatever it may be? Why does it matter? Well, it matters because the evidence suggests that extrinsic motivation, students who are driven by that, uh, I'm far more likely to lose confidence in themselves in the long run. They're far more likely to feel anxious and feel as if their academic career and their academic future is not within their control. And that these performance goals that extrinsically motivated students set uh, are far less likely to lead to successful academic outcomes than the mastery goals. So we have a situation where boys are far more likely to be extrinsically motivated and in the long run, that's not good for them. And the kind of goals that they set are also less likely to, to allow them to succeed. So this is, I think, a, a crucial point of understanding what's going on with the mindsets of many boys within your classroom. And this is something that we need to, to pause and to think about and to consider, OK, well, if we know that we want them to have intrinsic motivation because that's better for them in the long run in terms of confidence and outcomes, how can we kind of make that shift? How can we nudge them towards being more intrinsically motivated? How can we get them a greater sense, a greater drive uh, to, to have this energy to learn for the sake of it rather than to try to uh, achieve a particular aim? So let's have a look at some effective strategies um, that, that the research and my own experience tells me uh, is helpful to, to move boys on and to motivate them when they're switched off and struggling in, in your lessons. So the first thing I think we need to consider is that we have to be aware that subject specific success is, is crucial in this. So as a, as a secondary school teacher, it may be a case that a student walks from one classroom, does one subject, goes down the corridor, goes into a different lesson, and feels very different about themselves depending on which subject it is. In, in a primary setting, it might be that, that one hour you're studying a particular topic, another hour you move on to something else, and their mindset really shifts. Uh, and we need to bear in mind that, that to get boys on track and to get them to feel as if they're doing well, they need to taste success in the thing that they're struggling at to make them be motivated to want to do more of it. Traditionally, when we've been thinking about how to motivate boys, we've often fallen into the trap of using the kind of engagement strategies. Uh, the idea that if we can only hook boys into learning by giving them competition or things that we think are relevant to their lives and their interests, or, or making things active and, and allowing them to, to learn uh, you know, using their hands, all those kinds of things have traditionally been used as a way to try to engage boys to make them motivated. But I'm going to say that, that this is something that's not helpful and in fact it's counterproductive. And instead, rather than thinking that, that engagement is going to lead to motivation, it's actually going to be success is going to lead to motivation. They get a little hit, a little taste of feeling as if they can do a subject or do a topic well. That makes them want to do more of it. Uh, and that's something that I think is, is absolutely crucial. So rather than any kind of um, generic efforts to try to, to motivate these, these switched off boys, you know, instead of inspirational speeches or team building away days or any, any of that kind of stuff, instead, let's focus on looking, what is it that these boys are really struggling with? What can we do to make them feel as if they can do that better? 
Uh, and, and as a teacher, there might be certain parts of your subjects that they really struggle with and other bits that they are, are more confident with. And we think, okay, well, what are the things that are really holding them back uh, and what can we do to, to get them switched on and motivated to, to, to want to do more? Now, you might very reasonably say, well, okay, well, how on earth am I meant to get boys who are really switched off to be successful in my classroom, you know, that they're not really attempting to do the work. How are they going to be successful so that they, they want to do more of it? Uh, and that, that's a, a fair question. And, and here are a, a few practical tips that, that I've used uh, along the years that I think can, can really get boys uh, feeling better about themselves and making them want to do more of the learning and making them ultimately more successful. So the first one, I call this feed for fulfillment. So you've got a scenario where you set your class off on, on a task uh, and as you're circulating around, you go to the boys who, who are switched off and, and demotivated. And whatever the task may be, whether it's a, a problem solving exercise in maths or writing a paragraph or a couple of sentences in, in English or whatever it may be, you give them a really heavy scaffold to begin with and it might be that say 75 percent of the answer you you kind of talk them through it uh, and then the rest of it you you kind of hint towards the, the remaining 25 percent and when you go back to, to the class to to share successful examples and to share ideas you'll call on these boys and, and they will have contributed with, with something that's that's reasonably successful now, I know the main reason it's reasonably successful to begin with is, is because you've had a really heavy input into that. And of course, gradually over time, you would need to reduce that input. But in terms of getting them feeling successful, this is a way to, to kind of kickstart that, that sense of, oh, I can do this. Oh, I understand how this works now. And I'm contributing to the class with, with successful um, examples of work that I've done. So yeah, you really have to orchestrate opportunities for them to, to be able to, to briefly shine. And then, as I say, you can reduce that a little bit over time. The second thing is, is a similar thing. I call this rephrase to amaze. And this is during questioning. You will go to a boy who is struggling, ask them a question. They give you the correct answer, but it's lacking in detail. It's lacking in terminology. It's lacking in vocab. Uh, and what you do is you rephrase their answer, but you add in the detail, the terminology, the vocab, and it makes it sound like a, a really good answer. Now, again, of course, it, it, a lot of that's come from you. But the clever thing is that by referring back to this answer, not just later on in the lesson, but in future lessons, you know, you remember the, the other day when we had that really good answer about how volcanoes erupt? Let's remind ourselves of that. Uh, and what happens is, is that the, the boy who's involved or the boys that are involved feel as if they, they've given great answers and the rest of the class feel as if they've given great answers. And they start to, to believe and internalise this sense that, that they were able to, to say something impressive. But I think the, the biggest thing by far is the use of live modelling. And I've said let them write like you, but it, you know, it could be let them problem solve like you as well. Uh, so as an English teacher, I often come across boys who, who would say, you know, I'm, I'm rubbish at writing paragraphs. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to start. Um, and it can be really debilitating and, and prevent them from, from getting going. Uh, and by modelling frequently what paragraphs look like, and I, I would do this live under a visualiser, but you could easily write it on the board uh, and do it that way. Uh, I talk through the ideas, you know, the vo vocab choice that I'm making, the, the, the position of the syntax, uh, the spelling decisions and queries that I've got as I go through. And they can see, OK, this, this is what a good one looks like. This, but crucially, this is how that good one is, is created. And they can see that, that this is not something, uh, a successful paragraph is not something that just magically appears on the page. It's something that has to be worked at, it has to be edited, it has, has to be improved and they get to see my thought process and so they get to see ins inside the mind of the expert if they are really really struggling and really switched off i will often to begin with just say okay well just copy my my example down don't, don't do anything else other than just copy down my paragraph as i write it and talk you through it 
Now that might seem as if it's a little bit of a, a waste of time and it's something that's, that's just to keeping them busy. But I think there's a lot more to it than that. And the reason why is that I think, it, first of all, it, it gives them this, this insight into the mind of, of the expert, which is really helpful in helping them understand how to construct paragraphs. Secondly, it helps them build up stamina of writing something, which that if they're stopping quite frequently after a sentence or so, or never getting started, they don't get the opportunity to, to build up that writing stamina. Um, thirdly, it allows them to have a successful one that they've completed, even if it's yours initially. Uh, fourthly, it allows a model for them to, to go back and look at, and you can say, you remember the one that you did yesterday? Okay, go back and see which parts of that you can use. But you can also do cleverer things, like you can highlight certain parts and say, I want you to put those bits into your own words. And then it's a, it's a more advanced form of scaffolding. And over time, they're doing less of copying yours and more of coming up with their own. And they can see over time that their paragraphs are getting more like yours. And that's really crucial. And, and seeing that over time, I think, is one of the, the most important things that, that I've seen in my students. And at parents' evenings, you know, I'll have situations where parents will say, he didn't think he was any good at English. Uh, he never really liked the, the, the topic, never really liked the subject. And he's, he's much more confident now. And I don't think there's any kind of magic uh, to, to getting them feeling more motivated like that. I think it's that they've just become successful and they've used my ideas about the nuts and bolts of, of the writing process uh, and lifting the lid in that way has made them feel as if there's something that they can do. Um, praise is an interesting thing because praise is something that we're often told to use with boys who are struggling or switched off as a way to try to motivate them. Shower them with praise and then of course they'll, they'll want to do more work to, to receive more praise is the, is the idea behind it, the theory behind it. But I, I think praise is something that we need to be really careful with because it can be very problematic. Um, when we shower praise on boys for things that are, are pretty basic, you know, well done for, for knowing how to spell sad, uh, you know, well done for underlining uh, the date, well done for knowing what seven plus three is, Th those kind of things. Um, what tends to happen is we think that we are boosting them up and boosting their confidence. But this research by Stipec shows that actually when you praise students for doing something really straightforward, rather than them thinking, oh, that means they think I'm, I'm doing really well, they start to think, no, that means that they feel that I'm not capable of doing anything difficult. They don't expect any more from me. And as a result, with boys and with any students, but specifically with boys, it, it tends to be that it, it lowers rather than boosts their self-confidence. So it's very much backfiring when we're showering praise around in that way. Uh, you know, they know when it's something that's, that's hard won the praise and they know and value it and they don't value the, this empty praise that, that is often fired around for boys. In terms of unclear praise, you know, if we're saying things like brilliant, fantastic answer, great paragraph, uh, you know, wonderful uh, problem solving there. If they don't know specifically what it is that they've done that's good, they can't repeat it and it leaves them feeling really confused and uncertain in terms of reproducing it in, in future. So if you are going to use praise, you, you need to be very clear about what the praise is given for explicitly uh, and, and making it obvious that so that they have got an opportunity to, to do that again. And when we're giving feedback, if we start sticking phrase in there, uh, praise in there as part of the, the phrasing, either verbally or, or, or written, it really distorts the way that boys think about the work. They start thinking about whether they're doing well or not, or whether they're a good student or not, rather than focusing on the, the things that they need to do to do better, to get that success that's going to motivate them further. So if you are going to use praise, think very carefully about how you do it and do try to, to ration it so that it doesn't become undervalued. So what we're trying to do to move students um, towards, and boys in particular, towards uh, intrinsic motivation, we need to be thinking about promoting mastery over performance. And if we think for a moment about all the things that we do in teaching, in education, in the classroom, a lot of them 
are f- is feeding this idea of performance and it's not a healthy thing so if we're constantly talking about target grades or, or particular levels or particular standards and we're using that kind of language all the time with boys we're going to feed this this extrinsically driven performance goal monster that that is not successful in the long run academically so we need to to try to strip back those kinds of conversations and instead of saying you know if you improve this paragraph it will move you from uh, expected to standard to, to greater depth or if it will move you from a, a grade d to a grade c or things like that if we do that we're getting them to think in terms of performance and in terms of extrinsic factors and instead we need to get them to think about gradually getting better at something over time and seeing that and seeing that within their own work uh, you know so if they say i'm rubbish at writing introductions okay let's have a look at your exercise book uh, you know it's january now let's go back and, and see what you were doing in september can you see how far you've come on okay there's still areas to improve on and, and things that i want you to to work on between now and, and and the summer but if you put these things in place you're going to be a much more confident writer over time you see that i didn't talk anything about grades or exam performance or anything like that and and if they keep asking, you know, what, what level would this be? What kind of band would that be? Uh, what grade would I get? I'm just okay. Try not to worry about the grades. If you work on Im- improving and becoming a better writer, a better mathematician, a better chemist, a, a better historian, the grades will take care of themselves. And, and that kind of attitude is something that's that's really important for boys to hear. In terms of when boys hit a bit of a brick wall, we know that the research t- tells us that they're, they're likely to stop. And instead, we need to get them to understand that frustration is a natural emotion when we are studying and we're trying to push ourselves and do tricky stuff. And actually, this is what the most successful students do. They, they recognize that frustration is a sign that they're challenging themselves and they're getting better because if they weren't frustrated, they wouldn't be taking on the more complex work. They'd be going down the easy route. So we need to talk in those kind of terms. Now, a really useful thing in terms of thinking about goals, getting better at something over time, rather than performance, we need to think about trying to change their habits so that they've got these successful study habits. Uh, And it might look like something like this where you've got a student who doesn't particularly do much work on on a Saturday morning and he said okay this is going to be a a key role for me is to try to do more work then so that I can improve over time and it's something that he's got a clear plan has got a rule that helps with that plan and it's something that's becoming habitual over time and again this fits into the pattern of, of successful study sessions leading to motivation to do more of them but what we do need to, to bear in mind is, is that these things take time. And if, if we go back and look at this and we think, OK, if we were going to set our own goals, um, you know, if, if you're thinking about you know, New Year's resolutions or certain things that, that you might want to do, getting fitter, going to the gym more often, uh, you know, having a healthier diet, all those kinds of things. As adults, we know that they're, they're difficult and th- these things can, can take time. And it's exactly the same for, for boys who, who are trying to improve their motivation and, and trying to improve uh, their habits as a result of it. Uh, and, and when we think about th- those kinds of challenges that we set ourselves, the, the research tends to show that to, to change your habit in, when it's looking at something difficult like you know, quitting smoking, cutting down drinking, something like that, it can take on average about 66 days. So you're looking at a couple of months really. And we have to bear in mind that as teachers, boys are gonna have off days, they're gonna take steps backwards. Uh, There's gonna be certain days when they revert back to to kind of bad habits and and poor approaches and switching off and and giving in and things like that. Uh, And we need to stay patient and we need to realize that these things do take time and it's not gonna happen overnight. But with those little tastes of success and those little approaches that I've, I've spelt out and thinking about how we communicate and the language that we use when things go wrong, all those kinds of things can, can make a, a massive difference to how boys view themselves and how they view themselves specifically in your subject or in the particular topic that they're finding difficult when you're teaching them. 
So if you have further interest in, in finding about how to teach boys to succeed in school, uh, the boy question has got nine key areas to consider. Uh, it looks at things like giving effective feedback, dealing with, with challenging behaviour, uh, looking at boys' academic writing, how to make sure that your curriculum is challenging enough, uh, and so on, uh, and, and that would be something for you to consider. Uh, and if you wanted to to follow me uh, on Twitter, I'm at Mr. Underscore English Teacher, and I'd be very happy to discuss uh, this important boy question further. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, speaking to you, and I do hope that you found this talk useful.